Thanks for being here today. Um, so I'm actually going to talk about creating 3D content. So one of the challenges and questions that I often get when people start thinking about creating content or just creating an application, let's say, for VR, AR is, OK, how do we display content in there? Um, and it's all about 3D. So we're going to talk about that today. Um, and first, I just want to start off with why 3D content. And this is a little bit you know, specific to the Wayfair use case and how we kind of got to be using 3D. Um, but it can be you know, generalized to a lot of other industries, uh, especially in the retail space. Um, but it basically started with photography. So the image on screen is actually a render. We're not using traditional photography for the majority of our products anymore. We're now digitally creating um, these kind of inspirational scenes. So when a customer is you know, browsing the Wayfair site, we've found a, a huge increase in conversion for products that are showcased in this way and some type of lived in lifestyle scene versus just you know, the standard product shot of, oh, here's a chair. This is what it looks like. Because we find that our customers want to be inspired. They don't want to just browse for you know, a, a big box item. If it was batteries or paper towels or just generic stuff, then, then find a picture is probably all you need. But when it's something that's very personal, something you want to put in your home, it's something that people want to be inspired by. So they want to see it in the full context. Because of that, you know, we started this whole 3D pipeline. And this is kind of the anatomy of a scene. So any you know, of these rendered photos start with a lot of CAD geometry. And we're using 3D Studio Max to essentially build out uh, entire environments, collections of products. And then we you know, basically send them to a computer farm that renders out you know, the final image that is approaching photorealistic quality, enough so that our customers can't tell the difference. And our workflow is much faster. It's much more flexible. So with an image like this, we could you know, swap out products if we needed to. Things going out of style, out of stock, um, individually personalized for customers. Um, these are kind of the future possibilities that get unlocked by switching to a 3D workflow versus a traditional you know, send it to a photo studio and take a picture. Um, and then, of course, you know, we're all here thinking about AR, uh, as well as VR and web. And 3D content is kind of, you know, I think, the, the future of these platforms. At Wayfair, I run a team called Wayfair Next. And this is kind of our central piece that we focus on, is what can we do with emerging technology to enhance the customer experience? Um, and so you've probably already seen either our app or you know, others where it'll place like a product in your space. So you know, we drop a couch next to uh, you know, an existing space, and you can see exactly how big it is, how it's going to look, how it's going to fit. And that's great. Like, you know, everybody kind of gets that AR use case. And we think that that's still just kind of scratching the surface. And we're excited to kind of continue to push um, this AR functionality into our app and making it really useful for customers. We've also done some experiments with VR and letting people visualize their entire space. Um, we're doing things on the web now where you get a 3D viewer and you can see the product from all angles. We're also making our products available to customers um, and designers that use 3D tools, um, such as SketchUp. So we have thousands of products on uh, the 3D Warehouse, which is a SketchUp platform. And our B2B uh, developers can basically download any CAD file we have from our website and use it in their own like, presentations for the customer. Um, with Windows 10, uh, the latest update, you can now import 3D natively into tools like PowerPoint or email. And so we think that the 3D content um, explosion is really you know, just coming. And we're really excited to be driving this content. Um, but the challenge is the volume. Wayfair sells about 10 million products. And we add roughly 30,000 new products per week. And so at that rate, keeping up with the amount of 3D content that we need to generate is um, it's pretty daunting, but it's also a really exciting opportunity. Um, I'm going to go through the anatomy of what makes up a 3D model. So here we see on the left are the geometry. Um, this is essentially just you know, points in space and surfaces that define the volume of the product. Um, but it really starts to get interesting once you add materials. And that's where you start seeing more you know, photorealism and accurate 
product descriptions is once you actually apply a realistic material. But the product wouldn't really be complete without being in an environment and picking up lighting, especially things that are kind of shiny or have reflectivity built into them. Then you start to need to think about what's the environment that's getting reflected in order to start approaching realism. All right, so next I want to talk about sources. So there's a variety of ways to generate 3D content. And they all kind of have their pros and cons. Um, we're kind of thinking of this as like all of the above. We're not trying to pick one particular path or solution because each of these um, methods and sources are all relevant. And in our case, where we have so many products, some of them come from different areas and others we have to kind of do ourselves. Um, but I'm going to start with CAD. So initially, when I was thinking about this problem, before I started the Wayfair Next team, I just kind of had assumed everything today was designed in CAD initially. It's like, oh, OK, I have an idea for a chair. I'm going to draw it up, and then we're going to print out the blueprints, and then someone on the floor is going to manufacture it. But it turns out that probably 90% of the things we sell are actually not drawn in CAD. They're drawn, or they're manufactured organically on the floor. So people would set up their shop or their tooling to produce a limited run of a bookcase, let's say. And after they do maybe 1,000 units, they change the, the tooling around. Maybe they bevel the edges a little bit differently, or they adjust the dimensions. And now they have a new product for the next season. And there's very high turnover of um, products in this space. So we find that CAD data is an interesting source. It's not always um, the most available universal source. And there's also challenges with CAD data. Uh, when you think of especially like an automobile, um, all the components that are inside, you've got screws and bolts and wires and things that the customer wouldn't necessarily care about. They just want to see that outer shell. So removing that detail is one of the steps of the process that you have to consider. Um, just running that stuff with you know, millions of polygons on a mobile device is often impractical. So thinking about how can you reduce the detail and get the materials to look more accurate. Because for CAD, it's not typically the photorealism that's the uh, priority. Um, and what we do for a lot of our content today is actually what I'm calling artistic interpretation. Uh, this is essentially a, a person that would look at photos and dimensions of a product and draw it using software such as 3D Studio Max or Blender. And they'll create a, a representation of the product that, you know, it's, it's close enough, especially for the visual application of rendering a product in a scene. Um, where we start to you know, want to approach, I think, more realism is around specific like, dimensions and features. There's a lot of process on our end that goes into QA for hand-drawn content where you know, a person might miss some, a little feature. They might get the alignment of uh, the knobs off. And so we have to essentially go through manually and look at all these different areas. And that's you know, prone to human error and in interpretation. Um, an area of interest for us is scanning. And laser scanning is um, a really cool technology, but it's also a bit prohibitively expensive. Uh, it picks up all kinds of detail, both things that you want and maybe things you don't want, some imperfections. Um, the scouts that I scan, for example, has um, a weird looking texture because the lighting conditions from different angles as we were scanning it kind of fused together and ended up with a, a weird looking um, pattern. But if you look really close at the surface detail, we pick up you know, tiny little wrinkles and imperfections that really add to the realism. So ultimately, we do want to capture that data. But we want to be able to do it in a scalable way that um, doesn't take you know, a lot of time with an expensive device. And, over time, I think these solutions are going to become you know, more uh, affordable and accessible. But today, the state of, of laser scanning is, I think, a little too expensive for, for mass market applications like ours. Um, and then lastly, a, a technique that we've been really looking at for trying to automate 3D creation is photogrammetry. Um, so you may have heard of this before, but it's essentially taking a lot of photos on the order of like hundreds. We typically do about 200 photos of a given object from all different angles. And software can essentially reconstruct the uh, three-dimensional space. So it creates a point cloud. And then from that point cloud, it creates a 3D mesh. And then it applies the, the photorealistic texture on top. So the nice thing about, about this technique is it gives you really good results for products that work well for it. The bad part about it is there's a lot of products that don't work well for scanning. So if you think of like a piece of glass, for example, like different camera angles wouldn't necessarily be able to pick up that thickness of the glass or the surface imperfections of the glass because you're seeing through it, or something that's shiny or solid colors. 
So it's an interesting technique, and I think it's going to continue to get better over the years. But you know, again, it's another tool in our toolkit um, that helps us achieve photorealism that we're going for. All right, next we're going to talk about materials. And materials is an interesting problem for 3D because there's basically like two ways of thinking about it, real time and ray traced. And you can see you know, from this quick example that you know, the one on the left that's rendered looks a lot more like a photo. Um, and that's because it takes a lot longer to produce one of those images. Um, it's able to calculate all the physics and the light bounces. And you can spend an hour to render a single frame versus something real time. This is just a screenshot from the web. Um, if you're trying to you know, do something in VR, it has to run 90 frames a second. And so there's a lot of different you know, shortcuts and shading techniques that, that go into rendering something in real time versus you know, the luxury of time to do uh, our nice ray trace scene. So because of that, our materials um, can differ at the source. A lot of things that were authored for V-Ray take additional parameters into account that you can't necessarily do on a mobile device. So we have to try to find ways to make the uh, product look similar under different conditions. Um, so physically based rendering is kind of the, the latest and greatest for real time um, products. And we're using that now to essentially represent a, a product in a, a, a false like lit space. There's several different um, texture maps that go into making that model come together and, and look good. Um, the most obvious one is kind of the, the texture diffuse color information. So that makes the product look like 90% of the way there, I'd say. But to get it really you know, past the, the um, uncanny value of that's a fake product into the realism, you really need to add a lot more additional things. So like a normal map that shows like the little contours and, and imperfections, um, as well as like reflectivity maps, uh, ambient occlusion. So by combining all these maps together, we can get a, a really nice like 3D model that reacts to you know, physics, essentially, in a real-time environment. And so I think you know, that's the future. I've got a little picture of our, our lab in there. That's a 360 image capture. And that's essentially in representing the lighting. So as I mentioned earlier, anything that's shiny or metallic, in order to look realistic, it has to have reflections. And so you need an environmental map that you would show off these products in. Um, and so on materials, there's another you know, interesting emerging technique for material scanning. Um, this particular you know, screenshots and examples that I talked about are from um, Algorithmic. Uh, they produce Substance Designer. And it's a really great tool for authoring materials. You can do things that are procedural, so repeating patterns, um, you know, wood, things that you know, have some type of mathematical property that can generate an infinite um, material to things like this, um, this swatch that they sampled. We basically took four pictures with different lighting conditions. And by analyzing the shadows and you know, minute details and changes of the lighting, we can basically recreate a three-dimensional material. So we start to get some of those like normal maps and like, reflectivity maps that come together to make a accurate looking 3D model. And so this is a, a, you know, a technique that we're trying to expand upon to build out a nice common material library so that not only do you have good 3D geometry, but you have materials you can swap out. So if you want to see a couch in like 10 different styles, we scan one couch and 10 materials and then apply them and let the user kind of make those changes in real time. All right, and lastly, I just want to touch on deployment. Um, we talked earlier about you know, the big models like that are millions of polygons that can't necessarily run well on a device. And so we have to think about how do we optimize the performance of our models to run well in AR or VR. And there's you know, kind of three main things that I put up on this slide. They're not the only criteria to think about, but they're probably the most important. Um, the triangle count is essentially how sophisticated that model is, like how many pieces of um, you know, vertices and triangles you have that for every frame the GPU needs to render. And so obviously the more of those, the more detail, but yet the more processing that has to go in. Um, so we try to target something like 20,000 triangles. And when you're coming from a source that's you know, a couple million triangles, um, you think, oh, you're losing a lot of data. But there's some really interesting tools out there. Um, like SimpliGon, for example, is one that we've been using that the game industry has chosen as kind of their standard for optimizing assets. And it works really well at taking that high polygon asset and creating something that's reduced geometry. But yet the fidelity and the texture information kind of gets get captured inside the materials. 
Um, and then next is the texture size. So when you're capturing this stuff, like the higher the better. So we try to get things at 4K or 8K. Um, but for transmitting that to the web, uh, you're just increasing the file size. And oftentimes the fidelity, especially if you're looking at something from far away, doesn't necessarily need to have that high res detail. And so we can think about reducing texture sizes or streaming in textures so that initially the, you know, the client downloads the small like, you know, 1024 tile. And then over time they stream the higher res one. So maybe as you get closer, you can pick up those details. Um, and then lastly is the number of textures. Obviously the more textures you have, like the more detail, but also the larger file size. So we can typically reduce some of those textures. Um, the most important ones are, are the color information. The normal information can usually be pretty important too. Um, reflectivity is another good one. It's hard to eliminate uh, texture maps, um, but it's one of those things that you can experiment with for a given asset to see like, okay, what if we get rid of the ambient occlusion? Maybe it, it doesn't matter and we can take it out. Um, and then lastly, I just want to touch on a file format that we've embraced recently called GLTF. We think of this as kind of the JPEG of 3D. In order for VR and AR to be successful, we need to be able to have like, you know, easy to access content that's available in a common format. And we think for 3D, GLTF is um, the one to go with. It's based on um, like PBR principles. It's um, something that is small file size. There's a lot of people working on it in this consortium. And I think that it has a strong and bright future. We're incorporating it now in across all of our, our applications and experiences. So we can essentially author one client facing um, product and not have to maintain an OBJ file or a cloud file, an FBX file. We think that this is the way forward as far as presenting things um, in the web and AR and VR. All right, so that's the end of my presentation. Lastly, I just wanna, you know, put a little pitch out there for Wayfair and the fact that we're hiring. We're looking for a lot of open positions and the company has been growing, you know, like a weed. We've got a, you know, a plan to double our headcount this year. We're located downtown at uh, Copley Place. There's about 3,000 of us now in our building. And um, across my team, we're thinking about people that are um, in computer graphics and programming. Um, AR, VR obviously is an important passion for what we're thinking about. We're looking for a product manager for our AR features in our, our website. And we're always looking for graphics, uh, graphic artists to help us continue to push uh, photorealism to the next level. So thanks everybody. Thank you.